the 901. So um, why don't I introduce you, Dr. Kim, and then we'll just right. let you get started. Um, so for those who are tuned in, but I can't see, <laughs> um, as I was saying, Dr. Kim recently gave this uh, similar talk to the Department of Medicine about a couple months ago. <clears throat> And um, Don Gifton alerted us that this was very high yield for Emerge and that we should reach out to Dr. Kim to see if he would be able to um, enlighten us on some anaphylaxis up, uh, related updates. Um, he is our chair chief of the Division of Clinical Immunology and Allergy. And so we reached out to him and he's kindly agreed to give a similar talk, a uh, little bit more targeted to Emerge. Uh, so we're really grateful for him to be here. Um, I will monitor the chat for any questions. So guys, please, if you have anything, uh, put your questions in there at least if you don't want to um, uh, unmute. And um, Dr. Kim, I'll just maybe in, not interrupt, but if you have a give a pause in the middle of your rounds or something, I can interject with some questions if there are any. If not, we can just save them all for the end. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Kim. Right, thank, thank you very much. All right, so um, yeah, anaphylaxis is uh, obviously an important topic for all of us. And um, there have been some um, um, real advances, I think, because the, cl the clinical research in anaphylaxis, of course, is very difficult to do for ethical reasons, but uh, there have been some studies to suggest um, that maybe we should change our approach a little bit in terms of management. And um, also there's a couple of new auto injectors uh, available. Um, that, that you may find um, uh, kind of maybe more appropriate for some of your patients for, prescript, for prescribing. And another thing that I think is important in Emerge um, is that uh, I know many of you are very comfortable with ultrasound and perhaps something you should be thinking about doing is maybe, um, I mean, if you're, if you're in a rush, you, you may not have time to ultrasound, but in patients where you want to confirm uh, where you're delivering uh, epinephrine, uh, ultrasounding the thigh is actually not a bad thing to do. We'll talk about that a bit. Okay. So there we go. Okay. So um, a few years ago, this case uh, kind of um, opened our eyes up to um, the possible, well, actually, there was a case about five years before this in England as well. Um, very similar in terms of the, um, uh, the recommendations from, um, from the coroner there, um, or coroners there. So it was a, um, a young uh, teenager, 17 year old, I think, was um, um, flying from England to France, uh, uh, bought a, um, a sandwich at Prête de Manger, uh, I think at the airport. She's allergic to uh, sesame, uh, but on the, um, on the labels, there's nothing about sesame being present. And she uh, had anaphylaxis develop on the plane. It sounded like she was treated reasonably, you know, appropriately. She received two doses of uh, EpiPen on the plane, uh, chlorpheniramine, um, but unfortunately uh, she died shortly after arriving in France. There was a similar case um, of a medical student who died in England about 10 years ago. And the coroner, unfortunately, had the exact same recommendations or very similar recommendations um, uh, with both cases. So the coroner recommended that um, maybe the auto injectors are not designed uh, properly for, for all of us. Um, so the EpiPen has a needle length of 16 millimeters. If you want to deliver epinephrine intramuscularly, in this patient and the patient that died 10 years ago, um, the needle length uh, should be longer. And, um, and they proposed that they follow the UK guidelines and uh, use a needle length of um, 25 millimeters, which uh, I think is um, more appropriate for most women. I'll show you the data in a few minutes. And, um, and the dose of epinephrine may not have been high enough. The EpiPen of course has the dose of 0.3, the EpiPen Junior has 0.15. And again, in the UK, anaphylaxis um, recommendations, they recommend 0.5. And in fact, I didn't put this slide in, but um, even in Canada for our um, uh, vaccine anaphylaxis uh, recommendations, they recommend a dose of 0.5 basically for adolescents, adults. So the coroner um, came up with the um, uh, conclusions that the, uh, the dose and the needle length may not be correct. So they had some safety concerns, very similar to the coroner case from um, 10 years ago. Um, unfortunately in Canada, 
Um, I, I think you guys may, may agree. And um, the English are a little bit more blunt about things and, um, um, and we're quite blunt about these two cases. In Canada, I think we just kind of ignore things and uh, we, let things, we let things go until the media gets a hold of it. So, um, uh, so I broke the talk into anaphylaxis background and then management talking um, uh, about the auto injectors. And then um, uh, I'll talk very briefly about COVID uh, vaccine reactions, um, which is a, a hot topic. Um, and I suspect uh, you, you'll be seeing um, some cases uh, of this and um, it's not very common, but you'd be seeing some. And if you're helping out at the vaccine clinics, um, sometimes you're stuck with uh, decision on whether we should be giving a patient a vaccine or not based on a past history. So anaphylaxis, of course, is um, uh, an acute problem that happens when um, primed um, IgE molecules on mast cells and basophils um, are um, um, activated and uh, cross-linked after antigen uh, binding. And, um, and of course, these antigens can be many different things. Um, we'll go over the, um, the most common cause of anaphylaxis. And there's mediator release. Of course, histamine is a big one, but there's um, dozens and dozens of identified mediators for mast cells. Another important mediator um, is tryptase. And I'll talk about tryptase a bit because measuring tryptase levels may be helpful at uh, confirming anaphylaxis uh, in, in, the, in the emergency department. So um, all of you are familiar with, with uh, the, the general um, uh, definition of anaphylaxis and the signs and symptoms that can occur. I'll talk about a formal definition, which I think is, is kind of important um, in terms of um, when, when we're using the diagnostic codes in the ER. Um, of course, anaphylaxis can be mild to severe. <clears throat> the, the tricky ones are the moderate ones where I, I'm sure, um, and, and this happens with me pretty commonly in, in my clinic, in terms of, you know, should we give epinephrine or not? And uh, the moderate ones are tricky. And of course, I don't have a good answer <clears throat> for one, you should be giving epinephrine. Um, my general recommendation to patients is to give the epinephrine if you're not sure, uh, because uh, IM epinephrine probably is, is very safe for, for the vast majority of us. Um, of course, anaphylaxis develops quite quickly, uh, but sometimes it can uh, present after 30 minutes uh, um, with the known exposure. So this is the, an image of the formal definition of asthma based on um, a, a document from the World Allergy Organization. So, um, so the first um, um, category would be in patients where there's, even if there's no definite trigger, um, if, there is, if there are skin or mucosal membrane symptoms and um, uh, respiratory and or cardiovascular symptoms, then you um, have a, di a, a diagnosis. Um, if there is a, a likely trigger, um, the second option would be this one where they could have two of any of these four um, organ systems affected. So skin, mucosal membrane, respiratory, uh, cardiovascular, or, or GI. So two of these four, if there's a suspected trigger. And the third one is if there's hypotension alone um, with a trigger or presumed trigger. So these are the three ways of uh, making a diagnosis. Um, I just put this into text here, um, uh, and I would encourage you to, to um, uh, download the paper, and I'd be happy to send these slides out to you um, after the talk, um, but it would be, um, it's a good paper to review in terms of an overview of, of anaphylaxis. So this is just the, the definitions of anaphylaxis in text here. And I didn't put this case in, um, but I had uh, a, an amazing case, and and I'll illustrate um, the point about hypotension, hypertension. Um, my personal feeling is um, hypertension may actually be a more common uh, symptom with anaphylaxis. If they become hypotensive, then it's really severe. I had a patient that I skin tested for insect sting allergy in my office and her blood pressure, she had immediate symptoms of chest tightness, no other symptoms. And then some symptoms of kind of confusion she actually um, began to lose consciousness and uh, complain about spinning. Um, and her blood pressure actually went up to 210. 
and over about five or 10 minutes. I was actually obviously nervous about giving epi to her, um, but after I thought that maybe she might arrest on us, I gave her a dose of epi 0.3 because I was nervous with her in her case to give 0.5. And then uh, almost two or three minutes later, another 0.3, and she actually recovered within five minutes. So I'm convinced that she had anaphylaxis, but she had um, uh, hypertensive crisis as opposed to hypotension. So um, there have been um, some data from Canada, some good data from Canada, looking at emergency department visits. And uh, if you look at Ontario, Alberta combined over two years, uh, there was 85,000 emergency visits for allergic reactions. Um, the prevalence of anaphylaxis is a maximum of 2% of the population. And in, in the pediatric side of things, if you have an ICU admission for anaphylaxis, mortality is 1%. So, so still we see um, patients dying uh, from anaphylaxis. Um, I've had uh, two deaths um, uh, from patients that I've um, been, been um, actually not even following, only saw each of them once. Both of them had mild throat symptoms with their first reactions and, and they both died at about age 30 one milk patient, one shrimp patient, another patient with, um, with um, um, pine nut allergy who had a cardiac arrest in uh, Mexico on holiday and had uh, significant uh, brain injury after anaphylaxis. This is uh, a graph in terms of what's happened over the decade from 2000 to 2010. And the general trend is, is, is up with anaphylaxis. And um, the main allergen is food. So um, these are uh, trends in, Can in, in, in um, Canada. And um, this is US data, sorry, but in Canada, we believe the trends are very similar. These are the allergens that, um, that trigger um, uh, anaphylaxis most commonly. Um, and, and, and I think uh, food and medications uh, would be, and venom, insect stings, would be the most common ones you deal with. Uh, allergen immunotherapy probably is the most common one we deal with here in clinics. Um, there are some oddball ones. Um, we've actually had maybe three or four women with semen allergy. Uh, two of them we've desensitized with semen successfully. One of them actually went on to have a child after desensitization. So you do see some oddball ones. Chlorhexidine, actually, good, it's mentioned here. This is a relatively common one. Just be aware uh, that that one can cause some nasty anaphylactic reactions if you're using that in your clinic or in the eMERGE. Um, I just want to highlight with this slide um, that, um, that uh, of course, you can have mild to moderate, um, sorry, mild to severe. Uh, the severe patients uh, generally um, will have hypotension or cardio and respiratory symptoms. Um, and we'll talk about um, um, new data to suggest that maybe even, even in the moderate, moderate, moderate severe, um, that we should be uh, going beyond uh, epinephrine earlier, especially for the patients um, you're seeing in the emergency uh, because um, uh, volume replacement uh, may be really important or more important than we, than we initially thought. So this is just uh, an image of course of, of the organ systems that can be affected. Um, one that, and they're all ones that you're all familiar with, one that, uh, that we don't think about very often, and I've had two or three patients with it, are, are uterine uh, contractions as well. And I've had that happen a few times with allergy shots. Um, so, of course, all of these other organ systems you're, you're all very familiar with. Um, one thing I'll, I'll just mention to you, because I know you have to deal with this often, and I, I don't know if you've had a formal rounds on the topic, um, but something that's become much more common, especially in kids, but now in adults, is um, a condition called food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome. I suspect you guys have all seen cases of this. It's not IgE-mediated. Uh, but patients will have severe protracted vomiting, classically two hours after eating. Um, and kids, um, kids can um, have this uh, with many different foods, um, but um, adults, the most common food is crustaceans. We just published a patient on adult FPIs. We actually don't even know if it's protein triggered, um, but it can um, cause severe symptoms. 
uh, obviously supportive care with IV uh, fluids and on Dancitron seems to work uh, intravenously or sublingually if you have to get it in right away um, is an option there. It's, a, it's an oddball condition that's become common over the last five to 10 years. Um, okay, so um, graphs like this, we often kind of, um, um, uh, in the allergy world even, uh, kind of ignore. But I think in emerge um, this 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 um, th this um, these different patterns of anaphylaxis I think are very important. So um, classically, we think about anaphylaxis as immediate onset and then going away fairly quickly over a few hours. But all of you are um, probably a little bit anxious about this biphasic pattern, and I'll show you some data in a minute. But um, we classically think there's a there's a uh, a break of about one to eight hours be, be, between the initial and second uh, reaction. Um, the median time may actually be longer than eight hours. And we'll talk about a little bit about, um, you know, can we predict um, this biphasic uh, pattern? And then of course, there's the protracted patients that just have severe persisting symptoms. And often these patients need epinephrine drips. Um, but I think uh, this, this we, we deal with, of course, pretty well. This, this is one uh, that's a trickier one. Um, so um, I think we should be thinking about uh, these patterns in eMERGE because patients can die, uh, you know, with any of these patterns. Um, so, so this was a, a famous paper, and I think it still applies now, a famous paper published in the England Journal of, of Deaths in Kids uh, from Food Allergy. Uh, so they had six deaths and seven near deaths. So they had 13 cases. Um, um, and so uh, all of these kids had a history of food allergy, but accidentally ingested these foods um, in uh, candy cookies and pastries, uh, four peanuts, six tree nuts, one egg and two milks. Uh, something that we also sometimes forget about is that um, you know foods that we think are relatively benign, like eggs, eggs, milk, wheat, um, uh, can, can cause death. In fact, um, the whole change in Ontario um, over a decade ago with our um, anaphylaxis plan across the province, the Sabrina law, Sabrina actually died from uh, probably from milk allergy, um, cheese contamination on, um, on food at her school cafeteria. So milk can be an issue. And this is an important point here. So um, of the deaths, there was five females. These were the foods that caused death. Um, kind of as expected, um, the, the patients that had um, near deaths uh, received epinephrine faster. Uh, the patients that died, only a third of them received epinephrine uh, within the first hour. The ones that um, nearly died but survived, uh, most of them received epinephrine in the first 30 minutes. And then this is important, um, that of the deaths, um, sorry, of all these cases, sorry, um, seven uh, uniphasic, three biphasics and three protracted. So the biphasics um, and protracteds can um, be cases where you have uh, death or, or near death. All right, so how do we predict um, biphasic anaphylactic reactions? Um, so this is data from the, from the US um, and they highlight of course that biphasics can be deadly as well. Um, they looked at over 4,000 cases of anaphylaxis in a meta-analysis. They identified almost 200 biphasic reactions. Another important point is this. Um, some studies have suggested that biphasic reactions can occur in up to 25, 30% of cases of anaphylaxis. I, I think that's over, overestimating. I think this is probably more accurate. 5%, um, maximum of 10% of cases. And, and this is, was a little bit enlightening the median time to the onset of the second uh, wave is actually 11 hours in this study, some patients up to a few days. So um, this was very enlightening and not expected. And, and maybe, you know, shouldn't be ignored in patients when they come back even a day after uh, their original reaction. So, um, so this is kind of a typical meta-analysis approach where they start off with hundreds of studies. They identify 27 studies that they thought would be good ones to include in their, their data. 
And what they did was they looked at different variables that predicted biphasic reactions. So if, they, if the patient had food allergy, the likelihood of biphasic was actually lower. If they had an unknown trigger, this is a bit surprising, uh, the likelihood of a biphasic was higher. If they had hypotension, this is not surprising, the likelihood of anaphylaxis was higher, secondary uh, uh, biphasic was higher. This is a shocker. If they had received steroids, the likelihood of a biphasic was higher. Um, so this is something that's extremely controversial in the allergy world. And I don't have a good answer for this. And I appreciate that you all have to make uh, decisions um, uh, pro prospectively and proactively. And, uh, and I still give prednisone sometimes uh, to patients that are reacting in our clinic um, because I'm still a little bit nervous about not giving prednisone. But the data actually suggests maybe we should not be giving steroids. Um, if patients had received epinephrine, uh, there was no significant uh, predictor of, of a biphasic. And I think that was the last data point. So, um, so again, I would encourage you to, to look at this paper uh, more critically, um, but some of the data was surprising. And then I thought I'd touch um, on a a tryptase a bit because tryptase is, is a, an enzyme um, that, um, you know, that we, we often encourage um, you uh, to draw for us and for our patients when there's been a history of an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. And we believe that um, if the tryptase is high, it's helpful. And I actually, I, I think that's true. If it's high, it is helpful. Um, the problem is, is that this test is not very good in terms of, a, in terms of a, um, the sensitivity in a screening test, um, in terms of um, um, uh, making a diagnosis. So just to give you some background, there's um, alpha and beta tryptase, immature or mature. So there's kind of four types of tryptase, uh, alpha and beta mature, uh, immature. Um, when we're measuring tryptase, we actually measure the total tryptase. We can't measure uh, alpha or beta. Um, the beta tryptase we feel has um, activity in the body based on in vitro data. Um, it, um, it triggers complement, uh, it inactivates fibrinogen, and can have an effect on many different cell types. We do not believe that alpha tryptase is active. Um, but the, the sad thing is we actually don't even know what tryptase does um, for us or with us. Um, but, but it is a relatively stable mediator released by mast cells that we can measure. So that's why it's helpful. Um, so again, we can measure total tryptase. Uh, the peak time to elevation is um, 30 to 90 minutes, but there is a two hour half-life. So it's slow, I shouldn't say it slowly goes down. It, it quickly goes down over hours. So it'd be nice to uh, get it measured within three hours of the reaction. But even if it's five or six, if, you, if you're thinking about doing it, um, and especially if patient's going to get blood work anyways, I, we would appreciate you getting it done because sometimes it does help with the, with the diagnosis later. It does correlate with hypotension with insect stings. Um, but otherwise, you know, it's not a great um, kind of um, predictor of... Um, of, of anaphylaxis, I'll just show you the, of, of, or other um, variables in anaphylaxis. I'll show you the data in a second. So this is from up to date. And um, just, just to give you some background, if a patient has mastocytosis, which are basically too many mast cells, the tryptase levels are quite high. There's this new condition, a uh, genetic um, condition where patients uh, produce too much tryptase, alpha tryptosemia and their, their tryptase levels can be high. The standard normal range is about up to 11. Um, so if the level's above 11 and the baseline level's lower after um, anaphylaxis, uh, it's helpful. We sometimes use this, this, this uh, formula. So if you take baseline tryptase, let's say a patient's baseline tryptase level is five away outside of an anaphylactic reaction, you multiply it by 1.2 and then you add two and we think that that may be um, a way to help us um, confirm um, uh, anaphylaxis. Um, and I'll, I'll show you some data with that approach in a minute. Um, um, but but it's, it's not a super sensitive test. So, so this uh, is data from England. Uh, they looked at um, 
400 cases of anaphylaxis where they measured uh, tryptase in 140 patients. The mean time to measure them was almost five hours. No, none of the patients did they measure it uh, serially over the time in the eMERGE. Um, and this is what they found. If you had high tryptase levels, the sensitivity um, was only 28%, specificity high. Um, so you can see that tryptase on its own is not that useful in terms of sensitivity. If you lower the, the level, even down to 3.8, the sensitivity goes up, but the specificity is not very good at all. Um, so, so this test is, is, is not a great one as a screening tool. In a Canadian study, um, um, it was multi-centered, um, but uh, lead authors were uh, from Montreal. They looked at, um, they, they defined high tryptase as, as one of these two variables. So just an absolute high level or that, that formula that I, I just uh, outlined. Um, they had uh, over four years, they had 200 cases where tryptase was measured. They only had 39 with high levels. Um, if you use that formula where you look at the level um, in eMERGE um, and then you compare it to the baseline level and apply this formula to it, then you get a 60% sensitivity. So still the sensitivity is not great as a screening tool. So basically, you know, the, the best um, diagnostic tool is clinical symptoms and that definition of anaphylaxis from the World Allergy Organization that, uh, that I mentioned. Great. Um, is, are, do you want to deal with some questions at all, Gloria? Sure. If there's any. Yeah. There's. Um, we're, there was just a discussion about what people give for epi, but one of the questions for steroid that Dr. Price had is: um, is the concern with the biphasic reaction with steroid giving steroids IV at the peak of their symptoms and emerge, or is it oral on discharge? Was there any indication on that in the study? There is a bit of an overlap. So one study actually looked at pre-hospital steroids. So either given by the patient, uh, I guess in a clinic like ours, uh, before setting to eMERGE or maybe by the paramedics. So that was one study suggesting that there is a, an increased likelihood of, uh, of biphasics. Um, and then the other study I think looked at all steroid uh, dosing. So that included the ER. Um, so, um, and of course, the numbers are small. We're only talking about a few hundred patients. So um, again, I think you still have to use your clinical judgment. Um, the, the argument against giving steroids is that we believe the secondary uh, or, the, or the biphasics um, are, um, you know, it's a mast cell problem. Again, it's not really an inflammatory problem. So it's not due to inf infiltration of eosinophils is what you would think you use steroids for. Um, so the rationale for using steroids actually is not really there for that biphasic uh, pattern for anaphylaxis. So, I mean, for me, mild, moderate cases that I see here in the clinic, I actually don't give steroids. Um, again, it's, it's tough not to give steroids when they're severe though. So I think you still have to use your clinical judgment appreciating, you know, there's no data um, to support uh, the use or not use of, of them. Okay, fair enough. No, so no, maybe no, consider, no prospective data. Yeah. So maybe consider giving in severe reactions and consider not in mild to moderate. Yeah. Based on clinical judgment. Yes. Yeah. But even in severe, we don't have data to suggest or to support, support, a, support their use. Yeah. And I'll show you a slide in a minute about that. Great. All right. Let's move on to management. Okay, so this is kind of, this is a typical kid. Um, we have a, a whole bunch of uh, kids. Um, we, we've probably started about 500 now on peanut oral immunotherapy where we actively treat peanut allergy with gradually increasing dosing um, to induce tolerance. And it's amazing, even after education, these are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're bright people generally that are on oral immunotherapy and, um, and they still don't want to give themselves epinephrine. Uh, so 14 year old girl was having pruritus all night long after eating their peanut at night. And they actually, I give all my, our, my patients my phone, my cell number. So she called me at six in the morning, her mother called and she had throat tightness, shortness of breath. Of course I said, give, give the EpiPen, get to the hospital. Um, and, uh, and you know, you can hear them yelling and screaming and, and the kid, um, um, 
didn't uh, want to give it and didn't give it. So I said, well, you have to at least, you know, head toward the emerge and, and give the epi if, um, if there's, um, you know, they should give the epi. Um, so they went in and in emerge, she was given epi, uh, received Benadryl, um, solumedrol uh, in this case, and she improved fairly quickly with, with the epinephrine and discharged in two hours. So, um, so anyways, there's, there's this real reluctance of, of giving epinephrine, uh, and I'm assuming much of it's due to, the, to giving the needle, um, but it's amazing how often I have to kind of really, really convince people to give it. So um, this is from uh, the World Allergy Organization uh, paper. And of course, uh, it, you know, ABCs, um, epinephrine we recommend giving intramuscularly in the thigh. And I'll show you some data why it should be in the thigh and not in the deltoid. Um, um, we're going to talk about preload and why we should be considering, um, obviously, oxygen and, and IV fluids maybe earlier than we um, have suggested previously. And then, of course, um, uh, resuscitation if it's severe. So um, this is a paper that we published uh, two years ago. Um, in, in, in the Canadian Allergy Journal. And essentially we recommended the, the, the same thing, but kind of in a more simplistic image where we try to get across that epinephrine should be the mainstay of treatment. And we um, will uh, reiterate that for most adolescents, adults, the dose probably should be 0.5 milligrams IM in the thigh and then repeat it. Um, I actually think the more controversial issue is not 0.3 or 0.5 milligrams, but you know what should the second dose be and the third dose be? Typically what I do is I give 0.5 and then I give 0.3, 0.3. Um, obviously, if you're worried about the patient, you can give 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and IV epinephrine if you absolutely have to. Of course, dilute this down and give this very, very, very cautiously if you have to. Um, and then this is for outpatients and eMERGE, of course, you'll have oxygen and IV fluids available. So this is actually quite a nice uh, table on um, the, the pharmacologic effects of epinephrine. Um, so the alpha one effects and the beta effects. And one thing that's really, really, really important, if you have a patient on a beta blocker, um, you have to be cautious about how much epinephrine you give, of course, because if you have um, this this block and you have unopposed alpha agonism, uh, then you have uh, the risk of um, uh, cardiac arrhythmias and, uh, and, and extreme hypertension. Um, something I'm gonna talk about is the fact that we believe that epinephrine is a, is a great inotrope, um, and it, it probably is, um, and it is, well, it is, um, but um, during anaphylaxis, um, the effect of, of preload reduction might actually negate the effect of the inotropic effect. And I'll show you a study, the only study uh, looking at giving epinephrine during true allergic reactions to show this. So again, I think this is a great overview here. Okay, <clears throat> so why do we give epinephrine intramuscularly in the thigh <clears throat> and not in the deltoid? <clears throat> and the data is, it's from a small study with only um, basically a dozen patients. It's Canadian data, it's a great study published uh, over 20 years ago. And what they did was in adults in this case, but they have a smaller study in kids as well. They, give, they gave the EpiPen 0.3 in the thigh, uh, epinephrine with a syringe and needle, um, IM 0.3 in the thigh, intramuscular epinephrine in the deltoid, sub-Q epinephrine in the arm, uh, saline IM or saline sub-Q, okay? And you can see here that if you give epinephrine IM, either with the EpiPen or with the needle and syringe in the thigh, you get good uh, epinephrine levels. If you give IM in the deltoid or sub-Q in the arm, then it's essentially the same as giving nothing. So epinephrine should be given IM in the thigh. Another really important point about this study, and this, this point has been reproduced in a several studies, is that there is a rebound a secondary peak of epinephrine, in some studies, the secondary peak is actually higher than the primary peak. At about 30 or 40 minutes, uh, there's a secondary peak of epi. We don't know why, but presumably epi gets absorbed. Then there's some vasoconstriction in the muscle, and then the vasoconstriction kind of releases, 
um, over 30 to 40 minutes and there's a secondary serum peak of Bepi. So I actually warn patients at 40 minutes that this, this you know, they may get the beta uh, side effects and they often do at 40 minutes. Um, it's, it's quite predictable, it's pretty amazing. And something we didn't appreciate and just been writing about recently as we observe these, uh, uh, these points. Another important point with epinephrine is uh, when you deliver into the muscle is you have to get the whole needle opening through the muscle fascia into the body of the muscle. If you give the epinephrine and it just kind of gets into the fascia, the epinephrine may spread within the fascia and not get into the intramuscular space. Another really important point, especially in kids, and I'll show you the data from our studies in a minute, is if you have a needle that's too long and slam the EpiPen into the thigh like we normally recommend, then it might, the needle might actually go uh, IO. It might actually hit the bone. And of course, IO delivery of the drug is like giving it IV, which potentially could be dangerous. So we've, we've published a number of studies looking at um, tissue depth and patients at risk of anaphylaxis. So this is one of the first ones we looked at. 100 patients that had, uh, adults that had a risk of anaphylaxis. And this was not surprising, uh, except the sex uh, difference, um, the gender difference between males and females was, was surprising. 28% um, of women had a risk of sub-Q injections with the standard EpiPen needle length of 15 millimeters. There was no men in the study that had more than 15 millimeters of sub-Q tissue depth. So uh, females just have more sub-Q tissue. And of course, weight, um, BMI and height correlated. So we recommended using a 25 millimeter needle um, for, uh, for most women um, where you have to give epi and you'll be fine with 96% of women in our study. So um, again, all of you do, I, I suspect almost all of you do ultrasound. So um, this is um, uh, an ultrasound without pressure. This is an ultrasound with pressure like you're giving the EpiPen. And essentially the sub-Q tissue actually doesn't compress that much with pressure. It's the muscle that compresses down. And what you wanna do of course with the EpiPen would be to deliver the drug here. In the eMERGE, if you're giving it by needle and syringe, you're not applying so much pressure, any pressure really. You wanna deliver the drug here. So 30% of women would get the epinephrine sub-Q with the EpiPen. Uh, these were the data um, from our studies. So if you give it with a 25 millimeter needle, you're fine with 96% of women. And then of course, if you use a longer needle, uh, you're more likely to get uh, IM um, delivery. Um, and I'll, I'll um, suggest, actually, I'll just show you now what I suggest that you do. Uh, if you have a patient, especially uh, that is obese, what I would recommend is actually to use an LP needle uh, and I've done this a couple of times in my clinic here, is use an LP needle. Um, if, if you, um, you know, can, you, you can just push it till you hit bone and then pull back a bit and then for sure you'll be in the muscle, right? Um, I've ultrasounded many patients with over four centimeters of fat. Um, so again, if you want to deliver it for sure, um, I am, um, then you can use a longer needle. I would recommend one inch for as a standard in the eMERGE for adults for you guys. Um, so LP needle and, and ultrasound them. If you have some time, um, then you can ultrasound them. You can see the muscle fascia really easily. And then you can, you can actually confirm for sure that you're going IM with the needle. Okay, on the kid's side, um, the fi the, our findings actually were shocking um, uh, because we also assumed that kids were, um, with the obesity epidemic, we thought that many kids were gonna be at risk of sub-Q injections with the EpiPen needles. We actually found the opposite. If you compress the muscle or compress the leg with an ultrasound probe and measure, uh, we actually found that about 30%, 30% of kids had a risk of the EpiPen going into the bone. And we actually published a case of a kid where she injected the EpiPen into her bone. Um, but, um, but this is actually a, a more of a concern. And um, this is the same image. So just you know, in a pie graph, 30% of kids under 15 kilos were at risk of, of hitting the bone. If the kids are under 10 kilos, it was a 60% risk. We actually did a more stringent study than this one where we actually measured the exact pressure we were applying. And 44% uh, of kids under 15 kilos have a risk of the EpiPen hitting the bone. 
Um, so what I recommend uh, with kids is don't follow the EpiPen directions on the, on the label. It tells you to slam the EpiPen into the leg. Don't do that. What I recommend is squeeze the muscle with the thigh, take the safety off the EpiPen or other auto injector, squeeze the muscle with the thigh so the muscle doesn't compress down, then just press on the thigh and then just gently press until it clicks and hold it for three seconds so that the EpiPen is not going into bone in these kids. This is just a table. So under 10 kilos, 60% of kids have the risk of IO injection. All right, and this was the case where, the, where one of my patients injected it into her bone. Okay, let's get into um, epinephrine therapy and uh, some, some new um, um, kind of, not recommendations, but new data to suggest, um, you know, maybe we can fine tune what we're doing with epi uh, in terms of what we do uh, in the eMERGE and after you discharge. So um, this is uh, from England showing that if you give 0.5 epi, versus 0.3 of epi IM in the thigh, is that 0.5 of epi leads to better serum levels. And it also leads to improved, now, now there's obviously overlapping error bars here, but in, generally an over, over, um, improved cardiac output, uh, an improved um, uh, heart rate. Um, the bit of shocker, it seemed to improve cardiac or stroke volume a little bit, but I'll show you even better study in a minute suggesting that stroke volume did not change a lot. These, th these researchers actually had a stroke volume uh, cardiac uh, probe on their chest, on their heart as they did their studies. This is the study that was uh, published recently and very enlightening in terms of um, the fact that maybe we should be um, giving volume to patients earlier with anaphylaxis than, than we believe. So, so they looked at 57 adults that they knew had peanut allergy. They challenged the patients with peanut in their clinic. They had 14 patients where they gave epi, 11 patients where they had a definition of anaphylaxis. They saw fallen stroke volume uh, with anaphylaxis. They saw an increase in heart rate. And as I mentioned, on average, their blood pressure actually went up. It didn't go down. So. The, the, the more typical response with anaphylaxis is actually higher blood pressure, not lower. Um, and then uh, they gave 0.5 of epi as a standard treatment dose. What they identified, and I'll show you the graphs in a minute, which was enlightening, is that even though it makes absolute no sense to us that stroke volume does not change, stroke volume didn't change. Uh, during anaphylaxis with epinephrine, stroke volume actually did not change significantly. Heart rate went up. Cardiac output went up because the heart rate went up, but the stroke volume did not change and the blood pressure did not go up in these patients. In fact, it stayed about the same, even with epi 0.5, pretty uh, surprising. Uh, two patients I'll show you actually received two doses of epi and even in those two, there was no change in stroke volume. And of course, these patients were more severe clinically requiring that second dose. So this is, uh, these are some slides or graphs from the, from the study. So uh, right after anaphylaxis, the heart rate goes up 10 points with anaphylaxis. And then with epinephrine, the heart rate goes higher. Okay, kind of what you expect. This is what we did not expect, that stroke volume may actually drop a bit. And even with epi, stroke volume did not change significantly. Uh, the authors point out, and I believe, that I think this happens because preload drops. And even though epinephrine might have an inotropic effect, the heart doesn't have as much volume or enough volume to work with to increase stroke volume. So the preload is maybe the problem here. Cardiac output goes up because of heart rate going up, not stroke volume. And, um, and as I mentioned, um, interestingly, uh, blood pressure actually did not go higher with epi it actually came down. So the normal response to anaphylaxis may be an increase in blood pressure. And then over time, it might actually come down, which again, is not expected, kind of opposite to what we think. So, um, so um, this shows you graphically patients that did not get epi and patients that did get epi, the epi increased the heart rate, stroke volume did not change, cardiac output went up because heart rate going up stroke volume stayed down. So in patients that you're concerned with, perhaps giving volume earlier um, may be important for these people. 
These were the two people that got two doses of epi, one after 20 minutes and one after five minutes. And even with two doses of epi, I believe it was 0 0.5, 0 0.5, but don't quote me on the second dose. Um, uh, even with two doses of epi, the stroke volume didn't change, like pretty flat, right? So um, epi does not seem to have a major impact on stroke volume. Again, these people may be required volume replacement uh, to help with their stroke volume. Epinephrine is safe when it's given IM, but when it's given intravenously, then there's risk. So IM, there's really just the beta side effects to watch out for generally. Um, if you give a beta block patient three dose of epi, then that's a different situation. But in most patients, they tolerate IM epi. This is what happens when you give IV epi. This is a patient of ours that we actually reported. So he was a 23, 24 year old that had an anaphylactic reaction with an insect sting came into Emerge in a small town north of us. And um, the, um, the family doc in Emerge said uh, to the nurse, give Epi, actually 0.2 of Epi. So that's, he said, give Epi 0.2. Um, he assumed that it was gonna be given subcutaneously actually, uh, but the nurse gave one in a thousand Epi intravenously by mistake. And he went into this wide complex rhythm and when I spoke with the patient, when this was happening uh, in retrospect, uh, when I saw him, he said, I, I thought I was going to die after the epi was given. Thankfully, he cardioverted on his own and went back to narrow complex rhythm. So intravenous epi, even at a really small dose of 0.2, given at a, a too strong a concentration as a, as a push, uh, can be dangerous even to a 24-year-old healthy guy. Okay, so antihistamines, um, I don't think antihistamines are harmful to give. I would recommend that we give non-sedating antihistamines, even in eMERGE, if you can give cetirizine or, or there's, there's Blexton and RuPaul, which apparently will have IV, IM preps coming, um, give non-sedating ones if you can. Um, there's no evidence to support that they work in anaphylaxis in this Cochrane review. And then with steroids, there's a Cochrane review as well. And as, as uh, you know, um, I, I hinted to, there's no studies to support that steroids work or don't work um, in anaphylaxis. So, um, you know, we do it, but there's no data to support it. But um, um, to be fair, there's no data, randomized control data with epinephrine showing that it works in anaphylaxis either. It's just obviously we're not going to be able to study it. Um, and this is a, a, a study that looked at what happened pre-hospital, before emergency department visits for anaphylaxis in Canada, multi-centered, including London. And essentially what they found was that if you give steroids, these were patients that got steroids, right? Um, pre-hospital and in hospital. So about 43% of patients got steroids in hospital, in emergency presumably and only 2% got steroids before coming into the hospital. Uh, they found if they received steroids before coming into the hospital, trying to control for all of the variables, um, other variables, that there seemed to be an increased risk of hospital admission, ICU, or um, so second epinephrine admission, IV fluids was more likely if, if steroids were given before they came into the hospital. This is the study I was alluding to before. All right, so just to end, I'm just gonna talk briefly about the auto injectors because there's a couple of new ones. So um, even as an allergist uh, 10 years ago, um, and I, I would say that all allergists uh, had the same ignorance, even as an allergist 10 years ago, we did not know what the needle length of an, epi, an EpiPen was. So, uh, but now we do because we thought about it and we've studied it. So the EpiPen adult or the not adult EpiPen, the 0.3 EpiPen dose has a needle length of, of 15 millimeters. And when you actually test it, it's actually plus or minus two millimeters with this. The Epi Junior is a, uh, about a 13 millimeter needle length. The doses of course are 0.3 and 0.15. Uh, this is Allerject. Um, you, you probably have, have seen or heard about this one. This one is the one that talks to you. Um, it's about, the, about half the size of a big iPhone in terms of uh, the, the face size. Um, it's a little bit thicker than the iPhone now. 
Um, when you take this out uh, out of the safety, it actually talks to you and tells you what to do. The needle lengths are about the same as the EpiPen and the doses are the same as the EpiPen. In the States, they actually have a 0.1 milligram dose of this product, um, but we don't have that in Canada. This is uh, the, the huge advantage of this is the, the size, especially with teenagers are more likely to carry this. The, the new, new one is called Emirate. Emirate has a 0.3 dose and a 0.5 dose. So this is a huge differentiator with this product. And the needle length is uh, 25 millimeters. So, um, and, and you don't put a lot of pressure on this. And in fact, as I mentioned, I encourage not to put a lot of pressure on it. So, so this is a good one. I would say for almost all women should get the Emirate. And I would suggest for any of the patients that you guys are really, really, really worried about with anaphylaxis, they should get the 0.5 dose, of course. And, and this is what, you know, I, this is the dose I give in my clinic when, I'm, when I really think a patient's having a reaction, I give 0.5. And, and anybody over 50 kilos, I give 0.5 right away. All right, and then to close, I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides here because I'm, I'm sure you've kind of heard about, about um, th these cases and you've probably seen some. Um, when England started giving the Pfizer vaccine in December, like I think in the first few days, they had two patients that seemed to have anaphylaxis to the vaccines. And, you know, we quote rates of anaphylaxis to the vaccines at one in a million. And these guys have, you know, two cases on the first day and they report this, you know, right away. And of course, everybody became quite nervous and is still nervous about allergic reactions to the vaccines. Um, the, the reason for the reactions, we don't know. We believe that it's because of polyethylene glycol um, uh, in, in the vaccines. And this is in the Pfizer Moderna vaccines, not in the AstraZeneca vaccine. We don't know, it might be an mRNA causing a direct mast cell trigger. Um, but there is a paper that was published that looked at millions of patients that received the vaccine. And this is the paper. And essentially with the first 2 million doses given in the States with the Pfizer vaccine, the rates of presumed anaphylaxis was about one in 100,000. Uh, with the Moderna vaccine, there's a new paper just published, 2.5 per million. So the rates are incredibly small, but probably higher than other vaccines um, given previously. So um, these were just kind of an outline of the cases, but, but essentially, um, if you have a patient coming to emerge with a, an anaphylactic reaction at one of the vaccine clinics, then it may, it may be a real reaction. So, um, so just be aware that uh, there seems to be uh, more noise with these vaccines with anaphylaxis in our previous vaccines. So there is um, a website um, on the MOH website. There's actually uh, a, a link to um, how we recommend um, kind of dealing with patients that may have reactions to the COVID vaccine or concern about it. And with this link, you can um, find out what we've recommended uh, for Ontario uh, physicians and patients. So to close, um, IM epi should be the first line of treatment. The dosing we've uh, talked about a lot. And for most adolescents, adults, the dose should be 0.5 and emerge. And, and I believe for as an auto injector as well. Uh, I think you should be using at least a one inch needle in emerge and maybe LP needles. Uh, and I would recommend LP needles for obese patients. Um, the auto injectors, we have now all three of these doses available in Canada. Steroids, controversial. Um, again, I, I've been holding off on steroids in more and more patients when, when kind of based on the data. Uh, but again, it's a judgment call, of course. And uh, the risk with COVID vaccines quite low, but, but you will be seeing cases coming into to your emergency departments. So thank you for attention and uh, I'd be happy to deal with any questions. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. There's a couple of questions in the chat and guys, you can jump into if you wanted to ask something that you didn't type in. Um, you, I know you already addressed the antihistamines, but there's, we still and tend to have in our um, kind of power chart and stuff, Benadryl is sort of the first easiest thing yeah. that we just click on and order. Um, of course, you're suggesting the less, the non-drowsy ones, sertrazine, for example, is there anything in terms of antihistamine guidance uh, apart from just saying non-drowsy? Yes. 
I actually should have, I should put um, the paper up, but the Canadian Allergy Society just published the paper, a position statement on non-sedating, sedating antihistamines. Um, okay. one, one of the problems I think, um, so, so one of the benefits of Benadryl, especially when it's given IV, is it probably works a little bit faster, right? Between 30 and 90 minutes as opposed to, uh, 30 and 60 minutes as opposed to 60 minutes for the non-sedating ones given orally. But we believe that Benadryl does not help the severe symptoms of anaphylaxis. Um, it may help the skin symptoms, but probably not um, cardiorespiratory mm -hmm. symptoms. Um, the other important point is, as many of these patients will be driving out of your emergency departments after yeah. you give them 50 milligrams of Benadryl. And, and of mm -hmm. course they shouldn't be. So, um, because they're definitely impairing when you do driving tests, more impairing than being legally intoxicated actually. That's another mm -hmm. slide that I should have put in. But 50 milligrams of Benadryl is more impairing than being legally drunk uh, for, with driving tests. So those mm -hmm. are two big reasons for not giving it. Um, if you do give it, I don't think it's harmful generally, of course, but, but they should be uh, getting a ride home or taking a taxi home. Um, but I would suggest if you're not, you know, if you want to give an antihistamine to get an effect on the skin um, an hour later, hour and a half later, then I would give oral cetirizine or oral blexton as opposed to giving uh, Benadryl. Those of you that have given Benadryl, you know how impairing it be quite quickly when it's given IV, especially. Yes, for sure. And um, in terms of the auto injectors that you talked about, any idea about cost oh, for yeah, patients for these? So, so all of these products are covered on ODB and almost all drug plans. The cost is about the same. They're about a hundred bucks per injector. Okay. So, so the cost is about the same. Amazingly, in the U.S., that that Allergic device, it's called AvaQ in the states. For two of those devices in the states, if you have a drug plan, the cost is forty five hundred U.S. dollars. <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> Unbelievable. The EpiPen, I think, is six hundred bucks U.S. in the U.S. So I'm surprised we don't have more people driving here to pick them up. <laughs> okay, so they are all covered by ODSP. So that's all ODSP, yeah, all ODSP okay. and all about a hundred bucks. Okay, interesting. Um, any other questions? Everybody's an expert on <laughs> the evidence-based approach. Uh, we still use a lot, like Dr. Joubert was just commenting that we still, despite knowing this, this evidence, especially about steroids, I've heard this since, training, we still end up giving it knowing about antihistamines, we still use Benadryl. So it's just, it's interesting to know how we can change that um, practice moving forward. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think with all of us, it's really, it's really, really hard to change practice. Uh, and with steroids with me, like I said, I, I still, I still do it sometimes. And um, even though we don't have, have data to support it. And I think, um, I think one thing that would help, and we could do this with steroids, I think, is a randomized control trial. I think we could do it with steroids and in mild, moderate reactions at least, right? Um, um, but, but I think we should study it because I, I, I think we, as you know, in medicine, we do so many things blindly um, based on belief and kind of, you know, kind of just accepting this treatment over, over decades. Mm -hmm. um, and so often we're completely wrong about things. And the yeah. food allergy uh, example is a perfect example. We've been telling kids, parents to avoid peanut, for example, until kids were four or five years old a few decades ago. And now mm -hmm. we realize that we probably openly caused or contributed to the food allergy epidemic by that blind recommendation. Um, mm -hmm. RCT was required to prove that we were wrong. And we should do that mm -hmm. with steroids, with antihistamines maybe even with epinephrine, right? But yeah, yeah. Sure. Uh, the, the other one I didn't mention are H2 blockers. So there's a belief that H2 blockers may help with hypotension and anaphylaxis because there's H2 receptors in blood vessels. Again, mm -hmm. there's no evidence, um, but it, it doesn't seem harmful if you have a hypotensive patient, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't give it, but we don't have evidence to support it. I don't think it's wrong to give, but um, but it, it, again, we're doing it blindly based on kind of uh, beliefs. Yeah, there was someone who just, Dr. Byrne just asked another question. Um, so any pearls for anaphylaxis in a patient on beta blockers? Because he recently had a, had a case with a refractory hypotension and the patient received four liters of crystalloid and three doses of epi. Um, wow. And he was wondering if there was any role for glucagon or any of that. Yes, ab ab absolutely. So, um, 
So the data for glucagon is based on two case reports, <laughs> mm -hmm. not strong, um, but um, IV or potentially IM glucagon, look, look up the dose, but I think it's one milligram, um, may be helpful in that, that patient uh, because it bypasses the beta receptors. Um, of course, there's side effects, especially nausea, vomiting with glucagon. Um, but I would say in a case like that, you should really consider it after a couple of doses. Um, I had a near deadly case of a beta blocker and anaphylaxis. It was actually um, a physician's spouse in a small town um, who was on a beta blocker, had shrimp allergy, received, I think, three doses of epi and went into VTAC and emerged. Um, fortunately, one of the internists happened to be, be kind of walking through almost at the time or was there at the time. He cardioverted her, um, but, but with beta blockers, uh, the, the, what happened, of course, was the unopposed alpha agonism. Um, so yeah, so glucagon, volume, um, cross your fingers because <laughs> they're, they're really, they're, they're tough. Um, they're, they're really difficult. We actually give allergy shots to beta block patients on venom. Uh, so with insect sting, of course, the risk, for, uh, risk of death is there. And there's actually evidence um, that it's safe to give most of those patients venom immunotherapy, even while they're beta block because beta blockades required for the cardiac disease. And so we don't recommend giving the shots with beta block patients unless you have glucagon available. Mm -hmm. So. Fair enough. Um, I think our time is almost, or it is up actually. Um, there was just one last question from a resident about uh, those who have COVID, um, those who have significant allergies or allergy to PEG, mm -hmm. they're wondering if they should not receive or are there any patients who should not receive the COVID vaccine? Great, so, so if you have allergies, as long as it's not to the COVID vaccine or any ingredient within the COVID vaccine like PEG, um, they should get the vaccine like anybody else. And right. if, you know, mm -hmm. if they wait half an hour after, that's fine. If they have um, a, a, you know, a strongly suspected PEG allergy or reaction to the first COVID vaccine, then we recommend those patients get referred. And then what we're doing with them is we're either giving an alternative um, vaccine potentially, um, or not giving it and measuring titers, the second dose. Mm -hmm. Or if the patient really wants it, we're giving them a, a challenge up dosing over about okay. two, two to three hours. And we're, we're now just getting um, a vaccine doses from public health for that over the next few weeks. So okay. we, will, we will be able to, um, and, and the numbers of people reacting to the vaccine are higher than expected. Not true anaphylaxis, mm -hmm. but many patients are having reactions um, to it. Most, we can just give the full dose a second time because they weren't true allergies. But a few mm -hmm. of them sound like they're a real allergic reaction. So we're giving them cautiously. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Great, this is excellent. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Kim. Great, thank you and very much. We will make some make some changes in our practice moving forward. Great. Yes. Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks a right. lot. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Have a good day. Take care, everyone. Bye.